the concept of being is one which was pretty easy to approach in the ancient world. Nowadays, when you try and consider what what being means, we get caught up in the trap of of words. If we if when we start thinking about what it what it means to exist, we come to an experience of how absurd existence is. If you sit down and think to yourself about the nature of your existence and the fact of your existence, and you try and trace it back to some explanation, you give a, you try and find a cause that would justify your existence. You find that whatever cause that you eventually trace your existence back to itself must have a cause. So if there is this, if we think about it in terms of, uh, say, physics, if we go all the way back to the Big Bang, we say that the causal explanation starts at the Big Bang. But then, of course, there can be no causal explanation for the Big Bang itself. So if we justify our existence based on causes, then ultimately our existence isn't justified at all. Or, when I say justified, I mean rationally justified. So, th this whole notion that we can draw, we can, we can make our existence coherent and sensical by explaining it in terms of preceding causes. I mean, that's just, that's, that's a failed project. Because... The ultimate cause itself can have no cause and can therefore not make sense because we make sense of the world in terms of cause and effect. So the initial thing, the Big Bang, the initial cause doesn't make sense. It can't be made sense of with this cause-effect paradigm. Now, the reason it's so difficult to understand that, in the, to understand being in the modern world, is that we are so so dominated by this notion of cause and effect that we truly believe that a coherent explanation can be given. So as soon as we have this experience of how absurd our, our existence is, our, our instinct is still to explain that experience in terms of a cause. Why did I have that experience is our instinct. In the ancient world, however, uh, we weren't so biased towards cause and effect. We didn't have a scientific world view. So the notion, once the experience was had, there was no instinct to reduce it to an explanation. The experience itself was given its due respect. Because really, when it comes to understanding how unusual our existence is, it can't be put in words, directly at least. You can't put the experience into words. And our instinct is to reduce the experience to words. Because we have this experience and we want to share it with other people. And the only way of doing that is through verbal communication. But of course, I've had that experience and I'm trying to communicate through words that experience to others. And I don't think it's entirely impossible. Of course, I can't transmit the experience to anyone. So you might say that the description is more of a suggestion. But there's a certain humility involved with recognizing that. There's a humility in realizing that experience can't be directly communicated. It can only be indirectly communicated. And in the ancient world, there was a recognition of that fact because there was an appreciation for the spiritual or mystical, whatever you want to call it, world. I think in the past, in the ancient past, people were able to think that since they were, they were more open to religious and supernatural experiences, 
and so there wasn't such a need for words or the function of words was was different because nowadays if i have this experience of my own existence being being peculiar it's genuinely difficult to to relate that to anyone because virtually nobody has that experience or if they do it's that no one no one really recognizes it whereas in the ancient world since everyone was so open to supernatural things it could be expected that when you're speaking to someone that they had many of the experiences which underlie your words so now the difficulty is that we are so dominated by words that we really have no shared experience we've put so much effort into sharing via words that we've lost this intuitive mode of of, of communication where i mean if you've ever been on a trip with another person it's almost it's very frequently almost as though a, a telepathic communication takes place now i don't necessarily believe that it does i mean it could be but it's also very possible that it just feels like telepathy but the reality is that the communication is happening on a more body the body is communicating it's body language you become hyper aware of the meaning conveyed by looks when tripping with another person you can it's, yeah it is as though you can under, you can see into their minds at least much more than is possible in a sober state it's not just though that it's an embodied thing it's not just that physical communication becomes more pertinent but also i think because the psychedelic experience draws out these consistent uh features of the human mind we're actually much more on the same page than than we might have thought and the psychedelic experience makes that very clear so it may feel as though you're in telepathic communication not because there is such communication but because the realization that you're on the same page is just extremely intense and we can only really experience it as telepathy so if i'm having a psychedelic experience and i'm being possessed by this very unusual uh emotional state and then i look at my friend who's in the same state but i can see i can see his body language seems to suggest that he's in the exact same state and that is unbelievable and it just that that experience gives rise to the sense of telepathy you both look at each other and you think how can we both possibly be having the same experience this is astonishing there is a connection between our minds which we were not aware of but in the ancient world i think the intuition for that connection was was more available because the mind wasn't as segmented as it is now nowadays we communicate in terms of words but we forget our bodies and our intuitions and so we don't possess we are not comfortable with this wider range of experience it's as though they had available to them profound lenses through which to see the world and we're stuck with one but we don't even notice we're wearing it whereas in the past because there was such a proliferation of different lenses different world views different religious convictions that it, it was exceedingly obvious to everybody that the presence of that of a conviction is itself not evidence or proof of it and that if a person comes along we don't have to understand them in terms of our own conviction because in the ancient world there were so many profoundly different spirit supernatural views it was necessary and instinctive and natural to listen to another person in their own terms to recognize that another person may well have a very different lens 
But now we feel we're all convinced deep down, and most of us don't know it, that it's it's words, the logos, which is the lens through which we must see the world. And we don't really listen with open ears. We listen waiting to respond. And of course that is worse now than it has ever been. But it's not purely the result of media or celebrity culture. It is what happens when the mind becomes totally dominated by the linguistic lens. And so when we have these experiences of the absurdity of our existence, we don't, we are not listened to when we explain them. We try and explain them in terms of words, but no other frames are available and they just can't be packed into words, these experiences. Whereas if we had the storytelling religious nature of the ancients, it might be much easier to explain these experiences because everyone would have had experiences which shatter the linguistic worldview because see the linguistic worldview this following of the logos has its advantages it's this socratic idea that if we can just if we can overcome the passions if we can prevent ourselves from being slaves and driven here and there by our passions and we can direct ourselves through reason, then everything, that's the best way of living life. Optimistic rationalism, as Nietzsche says. But, but not every experience will fit into words. So there is this utility of words, and we have to, we had to reject the other frames in order to, in order to, in order to receive the utility of words. We had to sacrifice the others. We had to push all of our energies into this one mode. And it seemed quite justifiable because Socrates was considered the wise man. And Christianity certainly has had an incredible effect on the mind of humans. But now that the christian era is coming to an end we see the proliferation of experiences which cannot be contained within the verbal mode of communication and so other modes become necessary so it's necessary then of course to understand the ways that the ancients communicated with each other and hence to understand ancient philosophy and religion and in that domain the Greeks are perhaps our greatest resource although ancient Hindu literature is also also possesses that openness although maybe not to the degree of the Greeks but I'm personally not as familiar with Hindu religion as I am with Greek ancient Greek culture so I won't say but I am motivated to investigate the Hindu and Buddhist scriptures because I suspect that they will have they will possess the language to explain these experiences. They're not so convinced of the logos. They're not dominated by it. They don't subject everything to it. And so they're able to explain experiences which can't fit into the linguistic paradigm. And of course, in this new era, I don't know what the new paradigm will be, but clearly it's a departure from Christianity. So it's necessary, if we are to understand the coming era, it's necessary that we understand the era which we are leaving, which I can't claim to do in full at all. And it's also necessary to understand the era which preceded it, so that we might see a pattern we might be able to predict the direction that our cultural narratives are moving and of course there's plenty of material in the modern world there's massive and rapid change taking place 
and certainly there are patterns to that change. We can see the direction in which we might head, but I think there's just too much information that there's so much information that it's difficult to really calculate and predict what's going to happen in the future based on what we see in the present. Whereas if we take a much broader historical frame, we can see where we're heading. We can see where we were in the era before Christianity. And then we can see how Christianity affected us and what might, what, what's left of, what did Christians miss that the Greeks and Hindus and, uh, were able to, to express and to share and to live by. And then how might we take the best of Christianity and take the best of the, the ancient world and find a new paradigm, which is better than either? Because the consequences of adopting or simply regressing to the ancient paradigm is not good. For it was a world dominated by violence. And we would inevitably, if we fell back into the Greek worldview, we might have a few hundred years of of explosive creation and war. But with our um, technology, we would inevitably destroy ourselves if we would be as open to our passions as the Greeks. But it's supposing we did survive, it's inevitable that we would feel in the end a sense of, we would become decadent and we would feel a sense of spiritual lostness, just as the Romans did as their empire came to an end. And we'll be in a, precisely the situation that the Romans were, where they are so disgusted by their own decadence and by their lack of potency, creative potency, that they hunger for redemption. And of course, it was that tension which gave rise to the New Testament and Christianity. And of course, that pattern would repeat itself if we simply regressed to the Greeks as a response to the death of God. So we can't simply go back, but we have to go forward. We have to find a new paradigm. And so we should look to the Greeks, but then we should look outside of our own culture. Christianity, while profound and very meaningful, means nothing to Native Americans. They'd never heard of it. Or Pacific Islanders. Or Asians. And so... Or Africans, of course. So we ought to look to these other religions as well. For religions and philosophies. For for the parts of the mind which we have neglected. We should take the best from the Greeks and the best from the Christians. But as our world is now so interconnected, our new paradigm is going to have to be a global one. So our task is not, is not only to find a new paradigm which would satisfy Europe and, and the Western world in general, but we have to find one which is intuitive, intuitable to Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims and Native American religions of all, all colors and other forms of philosophy. We need a paradigm which can bring those all together. And I don't think it's going to emerge rapidly. There are going to be many which are generated in this period, and we simply won't know which one is correct. There will not be a correct answer. We are currently in a phase of establishing which one will be by experimentation. We simply can't study the books and perfectly predict what the next it will be. Of course, it will be informed by the books. And the more we can equip ourselves with the language of, of the ancients, the more we can express to each other the material with which we're dealing, the paradigms 
which me, the better we can express these paradigms, the better the paradigm we will end up with, and the faster we will get there. So of course understanding the ancients is vital, but it won't allow us to predict with certainty. Understanding um, the human soul is like understanding music. While it's true that there is a mathematical pattern to music, it can't be learnt by theory. Music is an embodied discipline. It's embodied art. So it's not possible to understand music by theory alone. And in the same way, it's not possible to understand history and the human soul by theory alone. But virtually all great musicians have been well versed in theory. And I suspect that the leaders of the future who will present their paradigms of the future will also be well versed in theory. But it's it's also true that the theorist, the pure theorist, will never will never understand music, and the pure theorist will never produce values. The pure theorist will never produce world views that engage the world.